Welcome to another episode of the Value Engineering Experts. Today we have a very interesting guest, Tabor Yastrzemski, like Carl Yastrzemski, the baseball player. Anyway, uh, Tabor uh, is a really smart fellow. He uh, he and I met at a MyTex grant uh, project where he, he was at UBC doing his master's in energy. Clearly a mature student, has a physics undergrad, and uh, Without further ado, Tabor, thanks for joining the podcast. Hey, Tabor. Hey, yes. Yeah, no, thanks for uh, joining us on our podcast. I uh, it's just a way of introduction, Tabor. Uh, you remember the MyTex project in UBC? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's when I. Uh, you were clearly the leader of that group, and you've taken it a long way. Tell me a little bit how it how it ended up at, uh, on the MyTex. We developed a C-Score software, which probably got you a little bit aware of some key software programmers. But from your vantage point, maybe go back to that time and and how it impacted the students involved in the MyTex program, which I fully supported at the time. Yeah, no, I mean that was obviously great. It ended up being a sort of random events, which led to some really good opportunities for everybody involved for, for many, many reasons. So I think, I believe it was Landon Gardner. That's not his last name, right? Gardner? Yes. Yeah, so you guys had met, uh, sort of randomly met on an airplane. We're talking about sustainability and uh, obviously talking about some opportunities and things that you were working on about sort of the, I think the concept of CETA and how, you know, from an engineering standpoint, there's really lack of an opportunity or lack of any tools out there that help people sort of quickly calculate what the environmental impact is. Like from a financial standpoint, that stuff can be calculated within sort of minutes. Whereas from an engineering or sustainability standpoint, looking at the same design, you know, it takes days, if not weeks to calculate what the environmental impact is. So most people just sort of avoid it altogether. But anyways, I mean, that was a project and, you know, obviously Landon brought that forward and I knew Landon and, you know, before we knew it that my tax, uh, the government, federal government was funding for grad students to work on um, a sort of essentially any project with somebody in industry. And that's where we tracked down, I think it was Frank, uh, Frank Liu from the master's program, and then completely randomly um, hand him to Harry he was working on his PhD in software development on uh, in a totally separate program. We just kind of put it out there to some of the professors and his, uh, his name came up from a few folks. So yeah, it was great. A uh, great opportunity to work together. Definitely got a, you know, my first look at what funding through getting funding through the universities looks like and how sort of the nuances and how all that has to go through. Cause I, the, obviously as a energetic young person at the time, we just thought, great, we'll, we'll focus on the project, work on the project and get it done in, in four weeks or sorry, four months, eight months. And obviously that wasn't the case. It uh, took a lot longer to jump through all those university hoops, but Either way, great opportunity, met some great people, obviously got to work with you. And now, um, yeah, here we are, geez, what, 10 years later and still still in touch, still working on things. So, so the, it was interesting. I, we took a direction, if you recall, of nine planetary boundaries. And uh, I can't remember where, where I took that, uh, you know, after we parted company and you went on your entrepreneurial path. But I, I took it actually to a, to a very simplified because the nine planetary boundaries have we tried to weight them and then it was really a case where some of them were being exceeded mm -hmm. but uh today i just use CETA sustainable engineering design audit to compare what i do Tabor, uh, before and after so for instance if i look at uh, the toronto greater toronto bathtub very interesting example um, with waterproof shockcrete replacing secant walls we save 58,000 tons of CO2 on, on one two acre project. It's a very overregulated uh, downtown environment, which we won't get into, but I think the ratio, well, the way we use C to score there, the ratio is 3.8. So in other words, it would be 3.8 more CO2, like the ratio of the CO2, right? It's quite significant when you look at uh, focusing on that value engineering, which is lower CO2 is where, where I've become obsessed with creating these patents and really trying to make a difference. Obviously, you got into the field from a physics background, which is interesting. You're, you're basically a physics undergrad, right? Very tricky degree. And you were mature. Like, what did you do before the 
the, the energy masters. You were already working in the energy field. Yeah, well, no, sorry. No, I wasn't working in the energy field. I was in sustainability. So as I wrapped up my undergraduate degree, and I mean, honestly, I was I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I, I really enjoyed the school, but it, it also became something where it got quite frustrating because there was just so many, not a lot getting done, just a lot. You, you know, you talk a lot about stuff, but you don't actually do much. And uh, yeah, coincidentally, as I was working on one of the side projects I was working on in the sustainability field was around... Um, uh, transportation. So we were trying to find way. Coincidentally, it, it ended up taking off. We we didn't obviously I didn't create Uber, but we were creating the same type of setup with Uber, which essentially linked Uber to BC ferries to BC Transit. And so you, it wasn't about individual modes of transportation. It was about basically just I want to get from A to B, and then our our app or what we were trying to build gets you from A to B, um, linking all those different things together. So lots of lots of stakeholders, lots of groups. And unfortunately, we'd started the project in Victoria and Victoria alone has 13 municipalities, which form to have their own BC, have their own transportation commission. And we just got completely bogged down in just all sorts of government issues and challenges. And one municipality wanted to do it and one didn't, or most wanted to, but one or two didn't. And it just became quite complicated. And anyway, so we were giving one of our presentations to one of the one of the public groups and there was a professor there from UBC who said look you're working on this project on the side you're not getting paid for it why don't you come do your master's degree and we'll help you guys get, you know we'll we'll do a research project around this and you can keep working on it at least that way you can get some credit for it and um, I actually in the end I turned him down on the offer um, definitely you know helped the transition some of the stuff and they they sort of ran with that I don't think it actually took off but yeah, it just got me thinking about actual uh, master's degree and going back to school. And while Ale, as I was doing my digging with the program that he was suggesting, I came across this energy one at UBC, which was really what I wanted to do from day one. I've, I've been always been passionate about energy and consumption, like whether it's production or uh, reduction. And so I decided to jump on that. And that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I did in between. Obviously, lots of different jobs. I worked for the Reese, uh, what was it? AgSci Canada, I worked for the federal government doing some research on um, just in the agricultural field and then did some work for some municipalities, just general general stuff. They had GIS mapping and stuff for the sustainability programs that are put together. So lots of sort of one-off jobs, all kind of in sustainability, but just not, not really focused until I did this master's. And since then, that's uh, what I do from when I get up to when I go to bed. So. Yeah, no, that's a good summary. Uh, and thanks for what everything you do today, Tabor. It's amazing where you've taken that company. Sustainable Projects Group, uh, multiple offices in Canada. As I understand it, servicing building owners, but your, what I would call a stadium pitch would be, pretend like you're trying to sell me as a building owner uh, or a really property managers are your customer, right? Yeah. So we do really, we work really well with clients that have a lot of buildings. So anybody that has a ton of assets. So we're not really going in and taking a look at one building. We, we specialize in looking at sort of a hundred plus buildings at a time. So lots of property management groups. Uh, we do work for the provincial, a lot of provincial governments, a lot of municipalities um, and school districts are a big one as well. Um, Cause we'll go in and one of our clients has, you know, 250 schools uh, that they're responsible for. So Long story short, we're uh, we call it a design and built energy efficiency company. So we'll go in. Uh, one arm is consulting. We'll take a look, basically how all the buildings are operating, find out where all the opportunities are for new tech, whether we're reducing energy consumption or finding places for producing energy. So solar, PV, um, geothermal, all that type of stuff. Then our other arm is in construction or project management. So we'll actually help them execute. So. The first group will build a 10 year, 20 year plan, however long they want to go for it, for whether it's GHG reductions, reducing operating costs, whatever. Um, and then the other arm helps them execute. So whether we are actually, like I've got plumbers and electricians on staff, whether we're installing it or we're managing, helping them put out our fees and finding other contractors and making sure that they're actually executing properly. Um, that was definitely one of the things we learned from your team with uh, what you guys did around efficiencies is, if you put that design build together, you don't need to over design everything. So if we've designed it and we're going and implementing it or we're managing the implementation, it allows us to put in only what's needed to be put in and we don't need to do much of that over design stuff. But 
anyway, so that's that's what we do. And then, you know, obviously we talked about before about the software. Um, yeah, I've got a third arm, which basically just completely optimizes everything we just talked about. But that's a big conversation in its own. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll move on to that software shortly. But that's interesting that uh, that you're able to execute because I imagine a lot of owners will say to you, well, you know, why don't you do it? And, and in, in com competition against some of the bigger engineers, I think they get lost in the weeds and, and tend to over engineer things, which okay. results in a lot of costs. So it must be a competitive advantage for you to, to pose that. Uh, oh, huge, huge. Yeah, we find like... I find this at the conferences even too with most of my peers, you know, we go and everybody's patting each other on the back talking about the two or three projects they did last year in downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver. Well, you know, we're talking about the 4,000 buildings we've updated on the generic building stock across the country. So, and, and nobody cares, right? Nobody, nobody really cares. We're, we're getting in, I don't want to call it getting the weeds because you just use that terminology, but we're getting into the, um, the stuff that needs to be done, right? Getting our hands dirty and actually changing stuff not just working on one or two key big projects so yeah huge advantage on our end yeah so i so i be, i would believe that the product side also benefits if we look at the products and engineering and contracting when you're when you're faced with electricians beside you you know you get that tradesman benefit and it must be tremendous really to have a plumber or a tradesman and i often talk about that in terms of their influences on my career were huge and so i would think that you're on the right path and that uh you know if you listen to an electrician or a plumber you can't go too far wrong they're just going to give you a shortcut that yeah. probably works better right yeah yeah they they like to do the job right so it's 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 wonderful to hear you uh describe the fact that you know maybe hcm hc mac on some of the things i did over the years with the number of startups i learned a lot from tradesmen I would often give tradesmen the challenge of the next day and often they would come in after thinking about it for free on at night and they'd want to solve it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's great. So let's talk a lot, a couple of products, like the Joby software, J O B I. Yep. Which, what's that uh, acronym for? J -O -B -I. Yeah, so joint operational and building intelligence. So we tried to go with a name that allowed us to, uh, because we're having machine learning components and stuff to it, we wanted it to be something you ask questions. It's about answering the questions or finding the, you know, the key things in all of the data you have available to you and actually helping you change the way you make decisions about your buildings. So Joby or Joint Operational and Building Intelligence. Sounds like a big investment. You're, uh, would you say you're an engineering company? You're, you're a little bit of engineering and products now because software is really a product is it not it is i we're transitioning to software as a service i think what we've found so we started as a, a construction and consulting company um that's well sorry started as consulting we found that there was a need for the construction component so we started to deliver that with project management um but there's way more we've realized where we specialize and like where we can really make a big impact. So we've moved that, we're trying to transition everything into this software to become software as a service. So eventually we're gonna to move to, um, all of our tools are gonna to be available to all the consultants for free. Um, we've already started working with the universities to start training on how to use our software. So energy managers, asset managers, um, individuals going into ESG strategy development uh, we'll have access uh, to this tool, sort of learn how to use it, and then also have access to it for free. So yeah, we're really focusing on the software as a service because that allows us to, we can just have so much more impact. I mean, we've got internally, we've got GHG reduction targets as a company. And, uh, you know, we've looked at how far we can go by hiring and training and hiring and training and doing construction projects. And it's, we have a, and we've had a big impact and we can continue to have a big one, but I think with this software and what we're trying to do with it and how we plan to roll it out, it's going to be a substantially, uh, just magnitudes bigger impact because we want to, it, we fully intend to use it internationally and there's, it's designed to be used internationally. So we can impact the whole world rather than just Canada. The obvious question is uh, there's inadequate software out there. Yeah, there's, there's lots of tools out there that help manage energy bills. There's lots of tools out there that, do energy models of single buildings, but there's some, there's three key things that got missed. Um, that was, sorry, I shouldn't say got missed, but we haven't been able to solve 
um, with the fundamentals in our industry that were available. So one of the key ones is the static versus dynamic nature of an energy model. So an energy model itself is uh, static, like the, the process. When you go out, when we go out, we get at the moment without using our software, we get hired to do an energy audit. The model is built on the existing components of the building. Um, so we, it's built around the existing boiler, the existing lighting system, et cetera. And so we'll put a model together. We make projections over the next 10 years, and then we hand the client a report. So that's a printed PDF report, which then they refer back to over the next couple of years, anytime they want to make decisions. Now, obviously, as time goes on, things change and those need to be, you know, needs to be updated. So every five years they hire us and we go back and do it again. Whereas what we're, what we've done with Joby is we've allowed it anytime a new piece of information becomes available, the model updates. So now, um, you know, we're not just estimating what the energy cost is going to be five years from now as the estimates change. So next year, when we're trying to estimate what the energy cost is four years from now, that model updates and your strategy updates and your costs update and the impact updates are everything. So I think that was the biggest thing from a calculation standpoint. There were so many variables. It just didn't work. Um, even in some of the, some other tools tried to address it and you'd have to run the calculation. It would take, a, it would take a day or two to actually get the results. And then you'd have to go back and make changes. It wasn't very interactive. The way, It wasn't as interactive as it needed to be. Um, and so we overcame that. So with certain things that we've done, we've, we've changed how we've created new protocols of how to actually model energy in buildings. Um, we've created a couple of new concepts, which previously didn't exist. And uh, it's just allowed us to overcome that problem. So lots of tools out there that do individual things really well, um, but nothing that did a really good ESG, actionable ESG or environmental social and governance strategy. And with Joby, you can do that. Um, yeah, it's something you can follow step by step. It measures and verifies along the way, automated reporting, all that fun stuff in there. And we've done a bunch of examples. And what we do with our clients is run them through what they're doing now. We run a sort of a quick high level with our system. And almost instantly, we can usually cut about 20 to 30% cost or get them to their target 20 to 30% faster. So it's uh, it's a pretty big has a pretty significant impact on a lot of these groups. So effectively, it picks the low-hanging fruit, right? Yeah, well, I guess, sorry, I should probably use this analogy. Do you, there's um, early 2000s, there was a mapping tool called MapQuest. Um, you go on the computer, you say you want to get from A to B, you print out, like you print out about six or seven pages on a, off your printer with your map route on it. And as long as you follow the route and you stay on the 401 or whatever, you don't make any wrong turns, you're fine, you'll get there, you have a good idea when you're gonna get there. That was MapQuest. About 2004, Google launched their satellites. Um, they started putting in sort of dynamic Google mapping, where as you're driving and you've got your smartphone or your GPS unit, yeah, things updated as you're driving on the way. So every minute things, or every 30 seconds, sorry, every second or two, things updated. You had access to traffic data, you had access to weather, you had access to construction, and you had access to what everybody else is doing. That's what we've done. So we've essentially just taken our industry, you know, where clients are making multi-billion dollar decisions on using MapQuest, and we've now given them the option to use Google Maps. That's probably the best way to, analyze, to, to put it together for your strategy, ESG strategy. So would you get a large engineering company to use it, or do you find large engineering companies are naturally uh, worried about your, uh, your growth? Like, is it, tell me, Tell me about the inner cooperation between consultants. Is it, is it yeah, so luckily, uh, like our our industry, at least in Canada, everybody works quite well together. Um, I mean, regardless, even if, even if we didn't, our intent is to provide all of our consultants, whoever's using the software, it's designed to allow them to take on more business and to give their clients better information. So, I mean, from one standpoint, they can't not use the software because the decisions or the recommendations they're going to make are going to be outdated. Um, and whereas all of their competition will have access to more information, more tech, more suggestions, more accurate readings, et cetera. So I think on one sense, they kind of have to use it. On the other sense, it allows them the way it's all put together with some of the uh, automated reporting features um, and sort of properly organizing all the data, they will be able to take on substantially more clients. So we're not looking to go direct client. There will be some direct client initially as we sort of validate and roll out, but ultimately our plan is to completely pass that off, um, all of the client work to consultants. 
um, and then have them as long as they're using our tool and we're we're getting our fee per building, which is what our business model is set up as. Yeah, like works for us. Obviously, we're getting paid. We're, it makes it easier for us to get at the clients. Works for our previous competition, but um, these new consultants now can take on substantially more contracts, uh, can offer better solutions to their clients, and just makes it a lot easier for them too. So it's kind of a win-win-win for all three groups. So you would charge a fee per building. And, and probably a nominal fee when you look at what it's going to deliver for savings, if you're able to get 30% better. Oh yeah. So it's very exciting. I, uh, and, and you've got a, a significant staff investment doing that right now. We do. Yeah. There's, there was definitely a lot. I see why the problem hadn't been solved in our industry, just kind of the math behind it and the concepts and what, what it's what it had to do with the software. So um, yeah, essentially, we've got everybody in our consulting team is uh, at least one way or another working on the software tool when it comes to how we're modeling, how we're putting those strategies together. And then we do have a dedicated, um, dedicated programmers, product manager, all that, all that fun stuff on the team, too. So, yeah, I would say at least two thirds of our staff are tied to this in one way or another. And so uh, how many staff do you have today, Tabor? Yeah, I mean, it's it sort of fluctuates depending on the projects we have on the go. Uh, right now, I think we're 44 as of today. So we're not a massive company, but we're not uh, not tiny either, I guess. And when we talked before the podcast, you, you talked about, you know, the, the the real constraint, I think, for like most entrepreneurs is working capital, right? Mm -hmm. So welcome to that game. <laughs> yeah. 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 Contracting is useful, but then contracting uses the funds too, right? Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's an interesting balance and no doubt you're probably more of a financial manager today than and people manager general manager but you maintain uh, obviously a vision that is quite unique if i look at a product I and mean, i know you guys deal with solar wall mm -hmm. i think there's actually a seminar tomorrow that i signed up for and i understand solar wall let's talk about solar wall if you if you have a minute yeah. it's basically a heat stack effect that's useful for for tempering air right correct correct and yeah mainly in the in the winter it would be effective right or yeah i mean anytime you can preheat um oh sorry the the biggest energy consumer in a building tends to be heating something right you're either heating air to heat airspace or you're heating water to then heat airspace or heating water to run hot taps so yeah, anytime you can pre use the environment to preheat something before it goes into the building, you've got massive, uh, massive energy gains because that's obviously something you don't need to spend a kilowatt hour or a gigajoule of gas on to, to heat. So it's a good, there's, there's, I, and honestly, there's a lot of technology out there that just doesn't get utilized because it wasn't either it wasn't properly sort of run through the hoops in the industry or consultants didn't fully understand it, or there isn't good examples. And unfortunately, huge amounts of good tech just gets completely overlooked and pushed to the wayside. I mean, geothermal in sort of central BC was completely, basically they botched the delivery of the training, how, of how they were training people to push geothermal in the early nineties. And as such, the last 20 years, 25 years, geothermal has been a complete dud in BC. And now they're finally realizing the mistakes they made and turning around and now it's starting to boom again. So unfortunately, there's just so much randomness about what tech gets out there. And, you know, solar, solar walls is another one because it's, it's simple. It's straightforward. Preheat, like have the air get heated by the sun before it goes and gets sort of topped up by your boiler. Um, it's really a no brainer, not a lot of moving parts, a couple fans, that's about it. So it's, it's a great example of a neat technology that just hasn't properly been leveraged. That really needs to be leveraged, especially in places like, uh, gymnasiums. We're finding a lot of these school gymnasiums are a perfect setup for it. It's just the paybacks are great. And, uh, that is basically a sandwich cladding system. It's basically, if you could describe it, what's the payback of something like that? Um, so obviously it depends on the circumstance, but if we can find that ideal kind of two-story wall, um, like something like a gymnasium, and as long as the heating units are relatively close, like you don't want to be preheating air on this wall and then pumping it across a building somewhere else to be preheated. So if everything kind of lines up where the units are pretty close, yeah, you'll see paybacks in under five years for a solar wall system. Um, we do have clients in the multi-unit residential space, some of those towers, we got places downtown or sorry, um, 
Lethbridge, Southern Alberta, et cetera. Um, they're closer to the 10 or 12 year payback, but they're still going for it because it's a very low maintenance system that's going, the lifespan is, is quite long. So it's still definitely worth pursuing. So in that case, you're, re you're really going around windows, right? You're not changing the, the, uh, the yeah, brand. We find in, um, I, I'm not sure what's like Ontario, but I know Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta, sorry, the prairies. Um, there's typically a lot, uh, just because of the cold weather, there's not a lot of windows on some of the walls. So if you've got a uh, south facing wall, that's in, in most cases, what we're looking at are buildings, there's essentially no windows, um, maybe, you know, one window at the end of a hallway. So yeah, we go around the window, but 95% of that wall is just wall. So we're not really interfering with a lot of stuff. So would your software typically, once you do the building audit, you measure I guess the uh, orientation of the building and you measure the window areas typically. And that would be, uh, does your software intuitively say, okay, here's the low hanging fruit, consider solar wall? Does yeah, and, and that's what's kind of missed in the industry right now. So once we build that model and we build, we wanna build a model of a hundred buildings. So we'll take a look at, call it this school district. We'll, we'll take a look at 250 of their buildings, build a model for each. And we put in all those parameters for every possible project that we have in our catalog or that we know exists out there. So yeah, ratio of walls, thickness of windows, all that fun stuff. And then it it, it'll go through all the possible technologies and find, okay, in these 83 buildings, there's an opportunity for solar wall. In these 32 buildings, there's an opportunity for solar PV. All buildings have an opportunity for a basic lighting control system, et cetera. So, because of the new, so we, we've designed new protocols for um, how to do the energy modeling to allow this to happen. We've also created new protocols for these energy conservation measures. So that solar walls, solar PD, lighting, et cetera. So now anytime, so we'll come up with a good strategy, low hanging fruit, best recommendations. But then if we get a call tomorrow from new tech X or we're, you know, we're at a conference and they're launching this new technology, um, our team can do a deep dive, create the new sort of template for that particular new clean tech and run it through the system. And then now our clients get an update and we can say, hey, these new technology became available. Um, you know, here's the papers and stuff behind it. Obviously, we need to validate the savings are going to be what they are. Um, and here's the 43 buildings where you could look at applying it. And here's how it'll speed up your strategy and get you to net zero faster. And here's how it's going to save you money. So it's kind of a never ending thing. Once you're, once you're in our system, you now have access to all new clean tech that comes out. No brainer for the tech companies to get into our system because it allows them to get access to some buildings. No brainer for the client to have their building set up because now, like right now, they just get they get a cold call from a manufacturer who's trying to sell them something and promising substantially more savings than they're obviously going to get on the building. With us, we can now, you know, we get around that. We validate, we find the right locations, we find the right buildings, and we tell them what the savings are actually going to be. You might put a few salesmen out of work. <laughs> but then, you know, that those guys on the road driving cars is much help. Yeah, yeah. To our uh, situation with the, with the CO2. I yeah. certainly uh, continue to, to strive for the built environment. Usually the new environment is what I'm a part of. You know, at one time I, I had a HVAC startup and uh, it's still around actually, Northern Industrial Supply Company. And we did a lot of fans and ventilation. I learned so much through that, uh, the moving of air. You know, uh, do you do anything in terms of humidification? Like, do you do you do humidification like uh, air streams there must be a lot of humidification need for hospitals correct yeah i mean it's not my it's not my specialty um so i you know i couldn't talk to it in much detail right now but it is definitely something that that does get looked at um especially when we're doing a deep dive in some of the if there are um systems or buildings where like i hear it come up most of the time when there's pools associated like we do work at community centers etc there's substantial impacts on heating costs of the air or cooling costs of the air when the humidity is different from, you know, from one room to the next. But I'm assuming you're talking about something more specifically for built-ins in general. And I, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't talk much to it, but what's the- I know, yeah, humidif humidification is a luxury in the winter, easy, easy to dehumidifier, but in the summer, but the, mm -hmm. uh, cause you just have to pass it over a cold coil, right? But anyway, I just, 
just curious about about how that all fit into the Joby software. That's very exciting. So if I had 50 buildings, my my square footage per building could easily be 10,000 square feet, let's say. Uh -huh. So then a 10,000 square foot building out of a package of 50, does the discount go down on the way to 50? Is it so much a square foot? Sorry, the discount of the implementation. The size of the client. I mean, the, oh. everybody pays the same rate. Yeah, no, there's, we are trying to have a pretty flat right now, right now there is kind of a flat fee to do it. Um, because we just basically, you know, we're still working on some of the pricing models. We are relatively new with the rollout to the market. Um, we've only done it with the Yukon government. And then we're working with a couple of the big property management companies now testing it. But yeah, so there are discounts. It just, there's not a huge value. It's not the per square footage. It's what ends up being is the value that comes from the software. So if we, we can do it on one building, absolutely. We, we do an energy audit. We find the opportunity. You can do your reporting, but Right now, a consultant can also do one building. You hire somebody, they can look at your building, they can do that for you, they can make the best recommendations possible because there's very limited amount of data. But a consultant kind of caps out after about 10 buildings, you can be, you could probably find the optimized approach for those 10 buildings. You can be as accurate as humanly possible and get the best approach where we didn't need to get computers involved. Once you get more than 10 buildings, it starts to become complicated, it becomes consultant to consultant dependent on which projects you pick and what the strategy looks like. And, you know, each one is going to have a different, is going to tell the client a different way to get there. So that's where, you know, when it comes to the pricing, yeah, it's not that we won't, uh, we're not going to jack up the prices for an individual building. There's just less value in it, right? The more buildings you have, the more value there is. So we are open to, obviously we are open to discounting the cost it's it tends to be per building because that's where the overhead costs are is getting in building the models um, if they want metering getting metering involved stuff like that um, so we try to do it per building rather than per square foot but right now we're fairly flexible so there's the initial auditing which you must be getting good at I, that Yukon thing sounds interesting how many buildings did you do up there uh, 198 I think. wow yeah and, and the client uh, is a good reference today I'm sure Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So they 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 use the software, or you use it for them. So we used so basically we went in. Um, we that was our first kind of called beta testing. Um, that one started two years ago. So we went in and ran it through our system, and we used the software to help develop their strategy. And so yeah, they were actually really help, very happy with the results because what they engaged us in another contract, which. Um, Coincidentally, was my previous phone call was just going through some of the results of what uh, what the team was pulling out. So, um, yeah, so they've engaged us again for it. That particular client, yeah, they don't need. They're not using the software to develop the strategy yet. We're trying to get them to that where they're logging in and they're playing with it. But um, that's ultimately the hope because we don't want to be holding people's hands. We want to properly educate everybody, whether it's in operations. Um, facilities management or sustain the actual sustainability department if they have one we want to have them understand what's going on so that they can make better decisions rather than us just continually getting paid to tell them to do it if that makes sense i mean i, I don't mind getting paid to do it obviously that's how we that's how we fund the software but in the end if we want to impact the entire planet then we're going to have to focus on training and use rather than you know, being that middleman. So. Yeah, certainly bringing, bringing a service with integrity is important. Let's talk about some trends in the industry. Tell me about EV chargers. What's happening in that space? Yeah. So EV has been an interesting one. Um, it's kind of an interim step in the long run. Like if we're, if we're thinking sort of hundred plus years scale of what we do with transportation, but regardless, it's a good interim. It's better than what we're doing now. Yeah, up, you know, up until about four or five years ago, EV projects, there was just uh, no pun intended, but tire kickers, right? Trying to people just trying to get a sense. Very few clients actually wanted to implement it, um, unless you're in co really core areas. Obviously, downtown Toronto, downtown Vancouver, that's pretty much it. Um, I think with a big push from the federal government in the last over the last eighteen months, kind of around COVID, I think they're they're just looking for building, right? How, what, what money can they throw at building stuff that's going to get people working and people busy? And one big one that they pushed was these EV chargers and electrification. So we've seen a massive boom. I mean, we went from, you know, 
probably a thousand fold the amount of chargers we've got in the queue right now. Um, you know, we've got 40 plus municipalities in Alberta that we're putting in fast chargers in at the moment. Um, we've got clients who are putting 500 plus chargers in and all their uh, commercial facilities across the country. And we've got multiple clients doing the same thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's really taken off, really, really taken off in the last kind of 16 months. It was, it was starting to bubble up last year, but as of this year, call it kind of January, February, it's just gone gangbusters. So, so is that, is that on, on its most innovative basis, solar, solar driven? Not really. Um, unfortunately, I think EV is, um, yeah, with electric vehicles, it's mostly right now, it's, it's focused on the provinces, well, should be focused on the provinces that have a clean grid. So that's where we see BC, Quebec, um, Ontario, in a sense. They're, uh, yeah, it, you're not going to beat the GHG emissions from hydroelectric. Solar would, solar PV is actually even worse. So um, yeah, those ones are great, great for the environment there. When we have places like Alberta that's going EV, they're kind of putting the cart before the horse, but uh, regardless, that's what their mandate has been is to push EV chargers, get people on board with that while they're working on the clean grid in the background. So they'll get there, um, but in, but initially it won't even necessarily be a net benefit for from a GHG standpoint, although it is, again, it's at least a step in the right direction. Yeah, you know, the, the ironic thing with a, a lithium battery is it's often said that, you know, you've got a big footprint with that. And uh, if you look at the States, for 30% coal. So, you know, it's false economy, really. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, my latest patent actually is uh, something I love to run by you. I'm going to do a little pitch here with you on the line because you'll get lots of views, I'm sure. The uh, is a windmill on top of a geothermal pile. Oh, okay. Because I have a geothermal that creates a water table with the drilled shaft and then it, uh, supporting to a windmill. I always felt the windmill industry could be something other than what it is. You know, the big windmill with the big concrete foundation and the limited life, but the, uh, and the fit programs that had to drive that in Ontario. But the, uh, the, in this case, we're talking about a high pole magnet motor and a 30 foot pole in a very windy area. I'm in a very windy area because I'm right off Lake Huron on a geothermal. And I think I can get 10 kilowatts for uh with with a five ton uh heat cool system for a, i have a six thousand square foot building here i want to do and so i've got the, those piles in and, and uh the pole stood up and uh, so what you have is a what, what you call a dry side and then you separate it from the wet side and then i run a water furnace right i actually run water to create an overflowing almost like a pond but it wets the, and it's highly conductive steel. I think it's going to be a very good uh, system and probably for a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? you could get a building this size that I'm in now done. So, so what would be the payback? I mean, it's, it's probably very good. I, the, uh, I have a wood over oil furnace here. It's an 1880s building. And I, I just fell in love with it. So I bought it. We have, I'll, I'll have to run that. When I get the figures, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about it, Tabor. It'd be nice to have someone like yourself with all your contacts. Uh, you just use it. You know, it's a little bit like your software. You know, you, at some point in time, you just want to reduce CO2. And you want to be honest with integrity. And the, the whole idea of, a, of solar and lithium batteries, uh, I asked you about the uh, PV stations. So uh, the role, the question I have is the role of subsidies, like the government's they've really helped a lot. And so provincially, there's certain areas that are better, right? In, in Canada, you always know by now what, uh, which, which ones are better. Alberta seems to be on the queue there. Yeah, sorry, so you're asking me which, where where are the key areas? Yeah, or it's, yeah. That's right. it really, well, yeah. So there's three, typically three sources of funding. I mean, you've got federal funding, provincial funding, and municipal funding. And, you know, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. Sometimes we can kind of stack them together, but it all depends on what the mandate is, right? I mean, the whole, one of the main purposes of any government is to collect tax dollars and then use that as an incentive to encourage behavior in one way or another. And in this case, if we're trying to encourage um, sustainability or carbon reduction, one way to do that is incentivize up dating buildings or implementing green infrastructure or renewable energy production. So 
Yeah, I mean, where I guess provinces or governments that understand that obviously are, are leverage that tool a lot more than than others. Alberta, yeah, there's a lot of money in Alberta. I think not so much because of government push, but because of just how dirty the grid is and where the opportunity is. So in the most basic sense, if you look at, if we reduce in Quebec, if I was to go LED with one of the large buildings we work on, there's minimal um, environmental impact. So minimal GHG impact because we're just reducing the use of hydroelectric. Uh, hydroelectricity. Whereas if we reduce it in Alberta, um, we're substantially, the like carbon intensity is substantially higher per kilowatt hour. So there's a huge, huge impact. So when you have federal programs that are mandated to reduce, you know, dollar given away to some company to reduce X amount of GHG or X amount of carbon, they get way more bang for their buck in Alberta. So we see tons of the federal dollars pouring into places like Alberta because then it allows them to meet the mandate that they promised when they collected the tax dollars. So yeah, Alberta, there is a lot of opportunities. There's tons around like a, a lot in the private sector right now um, for basic retrofits and upgrades or, you know, some energy efficiency production, a lot of solar PV. They're very basic. I mean, they tried to spend as little money as they could on executing the program. So the actual delivery of the programs are very basic. And I think kind of overlook a lot of lot of good opportunities so as for example what you just mentioned if there's if the math's right and everything's there and there's a good ghg reduction opportunity something like that wouldn't get funded in these types of programs but in reality it should be you know, ultimately it should come down to dollar given away for ghg reduced so anyways uh, lots lots in alberta bc spending tons they're trying to electrify everything um they're basically trying to completely get rid of gas in british columbia so Tons of different programs there. Um, there's three different organizations in BC alone, plus each of the municipalities, plus the federal funding. So it's usually it's a hard time for our clients to even navigate what where we come in is helping them navigate those programs because there's just so many and so many overlap or that uh, can be stacked. So BC does have some gas, but I guess the mandate is is uh, water, right? Water, hydropower. Yes, for sure. Because it's just, it's, it's so much cleaner. Uh, you can't beat hydroelectricity. You can't beat it from an engineering standpoint. Um, like you look at a natural gas plant, you know, you, you've got kind of six to 12 hours to kind of ramp it up or turn it down. Coal plant is even worse. Nuclear is even worse. Like nuclear is clean in, in one sense, but it takes you two days to cool the thing down, to turn the production down. So they're always guessing of what consumption will be. Hydroelectric, it's almost automated. You, you know, you're looking at five to 10 minutes and you reduce the power on the grid. So, and on top of that, there's, there's very minimal carbon, obviously production of the dams in the first place that has to be accounted for. So it's not, it's not free. It's not carbon free, but yeah. So anyways, that's why BC and um, Quebec just push for hydroelectric because it's, it's clean, easy to manage, easy to use. Yeah. Very good. So um, how's your family? I got to ask you about your family. Yeah. <laughs> good. You got two kids, right? Yes, spend yes, time three year old. So Forrest is three. Oakley is just over one now. So yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of fun, but a lot of work. Yeah, it's a it's a nice to, to hear the stories about families. And uh make sure you don't work too hard, Tabor. Yeah. We often as entrepreneurs put in lots of hours, but uh I imagine you're putting in a lot of hours. You know, sometimes just thinking is a is a job, eh? Mm -hmm. you think about ideas and whatnot but it sounds like you're well on your way and how's the uh the, the market i mean are you able to attract investment i mean i would think that's an avenue for you to attract investors yeah we just went out i guess about four weeks ago we just put our um first sort of package together for raising some capital um mostly just around the software like i don't think nobody's interested in a consulting company or construction well sorry few groups are interested in consulting company or construction company. So now that we have fully committed to be software as a service, now that we're ready to launch our tool, um, I think, yeah, we are definitely looking for investment in a group that has some sort of experience and interest um, taking this international, because that is obviously, I, I don't have experience there. And there's a massive, massive opportunity with it. So yeah, the just started a few weeks ago. Um, the initial group that we met with is very interested. Uh, we are fully supported by B BDC has given us a lot of money. EDC's um, been supporting us as well. Um, there's a provincial program too. We were awarded. Uh, we were um, 
awarded uh, a pretty substantial amount of money to work in the software there too. So it's, yeah, we've got a lot, lot of backing, a lot of support, and now we're looking to try to bring some groups in from, uh, yeah, from the sort of private sector. I would thought that you, without some of your customer group, you'd probably be uh, looking at uh, targeting some of those investors, but I suppose they're not sophisticated. They have a focused business plan. There isn't, they're, on, they're not big companies if they're property managers, right? Yeah, and I mean, they do actually invest. It looks like they will be investing in a roundabout way because what ends up happening is they're uh, like a REIT is a really common client of ours. Um, you know, they're trying to make as much money as they can off their buildings with spending as little as possible, and we can definitely help them do that. But yeah, their REITs go back into other funds, and those funds then go cycle through some of the VC groups that we're talking to. So in the end, I think it does, you know, the people we talk to in the organization necessarily won't be investing in us, but um, the profits they make would likely be invested back around into it. So it's all just flowing around and a bunch of circles. It's uh, it's an interesting space. So Joby, would, would it be something that has its own website now? Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've, yeah. So on, so SP, so sustainable projects group is the company. So suspg.com takes us to the website and then Joby's on there. I mean, we've got the original, like the images and stuff there are outdated. It's just the original interface um, that we had and we've done a big, big facelift on the graphs and interactive stuff. So hopefully within the next month, we'll have the new uh, website launch where you can actually interact with the data. We're hoping to make it where we can, you know, go into our sales meetings with clients, put in some really basic information and then start to develop a strategy with them right from day one and just show them what it looks like. And then they can play with the, play with the data and graphs and see what happens. So hopefully that'll be out next month. So most of your business today is, is in Canada. Yes. Yeah. We just, we know the market. you know, we're comfortable with it. We've got locations across the country. We've got partners across the country, whatever's needed. We can, um, we can execute pretty much everywhere in Canada. Definitely interested outside of Canada. Just haven't really got to it yet. And, Glad I didn't invest too much money into it pre-COVID because I think it would have been uh, money lost at that point. So now that things are opening up and getting a little easier, it's definitely on our radar by uh, December 2023 to have our first client set up there. Yeah, that's very good. Probably uh, a good time to wrap it up, Tabor. Thanks a lot for uh, being a guest. And uh, let's do it again. I certainly enjoyed meeting the fellow that runs your systems that's running that solar wall thing tomorrow. Talked to him earlier because I, I was on your website. Okay. And I, and I wanted to test your customer service. And bang, that guy was right on. Like um he's all over it. Yeah, I know we've we've got a few folks that are uh managing sort of how sort of the in inbound marketing. So I'm glad glad to hear that. I'll give him a little pat on the back for that. Yeah, no, I, I thought I better do some homework before I got you on today. <laughs> Perfect. And please send me the information. I'm, I'm definitely interested in um, what you're talking about the geothermal and the, the windmill. I think there, especially when there's water involved with geothermal, I think there's tons of opportunity that does not get leveraged at all, especially if we're moving towards net zero and with the step code and BC, geothermal is going to be a big part of that answer. So, yeah, no, I, I, I really like your opinion. And certainly, you know, as a friend, I'm, I'm pricing it very cost effectively on a project basis. Are you familiar with high pole magnet motors? No, not. I took, I took a 15 and a 30, 1500 okay. RPM. And I machined out the core of the motor and we got 600 pound high pole magnets and uh, epoxied them in. And at 12 kilometers it turns into a generator. Uh, okay. So that's, that's very effective to get to 10 kilowatts by just putting a high pole magnet motor at the top. And, you know, the safe speeds of a windmill would be maybe 500 RPM. And we've tested the motor well above that, but uh, it, it would last a long time. And the idea would be, you know, for wind is really cost effective. So it's like water, right? Mm -hmm. You just have to change how you look at it properly, right? Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't, it needs to be. If we can get a smaller scale, because we do get asked quite regularly, you know, what's what's the opportunity of wind in sort of small scale production in these existing buildings? Because you got, we've got cities like Lethbridge, um, you know, Kelowna, whatever sort of mid sized cities that have lots, lots and lots of wind that just doesn't get utilized at all because there just hasn't been a cost effective thing put in place. So we're always looking. So if there, if you've got a solution, we're uh, definitely curious. 
we're, we're going to try vertical blades and we, you know, I really wanted to create something that didn't kill birds. And there's big windmills all down the, the coast in Lake Huron, but, uh, you know, not anymore. It's, there's nothing being built now. And uh, so this would be a, a 30 foot pole on a 20 inch shaft, very safe, connected to a, a, a wet geothermal, but the, the actual pole, I, I didn't get a permit or anything. You know, that really helps too, right? I don't have to hire an engineer to do something that's experimental. And maybe, maybe you know, a, a number of those, uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense to, uh, to, to try and innovate that way. I have a very good solar guy in my, in my community here that I befriended. And uh, the guy really knows his stuff. So he had a, he's done it before on a small scale. And I said, well, how big can we go? And, you know, technically that thing will run and run and run and hopefully not kill any birds. Anyway, Tabor, I love you. Take care, bud. And uh, thanks for everything, uh, you know, for keeping in touch and for all you do for sustainability in Canada. Definitely appreciate that, Mark. It's always, always great catching up. And, uh, and likewise, definitely appreciate the feedback recommendations. And like I said, many, many of the things you may not have noticed, but yeah, I've, I've learned a lot from you when it comes to sustainability in the business world. So a lot of that's being applied in what we're doing. So definitely appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it's teamwork, right? Teamwork and innovation. I like the leading edge. And let's, uh, let's continue to develop it together, Tabor. Anyway, thanks again, bud. Thanks, Brian. We'll talk to you soon. Sure.